If there are not any more uh, questions in the audience, I propose you to give the floor to Stuart Wright from uh, Lamar University. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have any PowerPoint presentation. You Let's go. Or maybe, yeah. It's maybe it's better if you see it in here. Yeah. So you're going to give us your analysis on Christian nationalism, defiant prophets, and January the, th the sixth insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Oh yeah, yeah. The PowerPoints are the, are the highlight of the presentation. I took quite a while to put these together, so I think you'll appreciate them. Um, this paper is going to be published uh, in a volume edited by Gordon Melton, looking at the uh, a new Christian religious movement called the New Apostolic Reformation Movement. Have any of you heard of this? It's a, it's a, move, it's a spin off of a Pentecostal movement where you have a, um, a group of, of uh, ministers who claim that they're last day apostles and prophets and they literally prophesy almost on a daily, certainly on a weekly basis. and. Um, uh, for some reason, they have, um, they all seem to be linked heavily to kind of a, a, a far right Christian uh, patriotism uh, forming, uh, I think, the core of, of, uh, of Christian nationalist movements. So that's what I'm going to talk about. In the months and days leading up to the uh, 2020 U.S. presidential election, no less than 50 self-proclaimed prophets and apostles tied to the new apostolic reformation movement boldly predicted that Donald Trump would uh, win re-election. Uh, following Trump's election in 2016 and his courting of conservative Christian leaders, a surge of NAR, I want to say NRA, excuse me, I'm from Texas, <coughs> that has a different meaning. NAR prophets endorsed the, prof the president and claimed to receive uh, divine direction as to his role in restoring Christian values and the republic. But in the aftermath of the election, uh, this legion of prophets faced the stark reality of Joe Biden's uh, uh, victory by more than 7 ma million votes and the unsettling prospect of a highly uh, public disconfirmation. For scholars who have studied the failure of prophecy for more than half a century, this collective prophetic failure was an unparalleled event. In another work, I examined uh, the range of reaction by these prophets to prophetic failure, and I offered an explanation of the, culti uh, the collective failure as a product of insular communication networks, which created a near-closed system of shared beliefs and divine proclamations. I found that consensus among the prophets could be attributed to the web of powerful new social media platforms reinforcing alternative political messaging and narratives within this subculture, combined with a deep skepticism toward mainstream news media as fake news. By developing the ap autonomous networks of horizontal communication, these religious leaders were able to invent their own projects, build programs, schemes, and ventures sharing experiences, occupying the medium, and creating the message. The origins of this virtual network was created from a website called Elijah's List. It's a, crea it's a Christian prophetic website created by uh, Steve Schultz in 1997. The mission statement from the website says it's called to transmit around the world in agreement with the Holy Scripture, fresh daily prophetic manna from the Lord regarding the days in which we live. The site hosts content for dozens of NRA prophets, NAR prophets, including the links to their own websites, books, videos, archived uh, sermons or prophetic messages in schools and academies. But in this paper, I want to address a subset of NAR prophets who not only refused to acknowledge their failed prophecy, but responded with defiance. I believe it merits our attention as a, uh, as a unique response category. I'm sorry, I need to go back here. There we go. Whoops.
There we go. Sorry. So there are several aspects of defiance uh, in the, this mode here that distinguish it from another, any other type of reaction found in prior studies. First, it involves a group of prophets other than a single individual laying claim to charismatic authority and hence evidences a deployment of leveraged claims to legitimacy. Second, dissemination of the Trump prophecy was made widely known through an electronic and digital eco media system which over time reached hundreds of thousands of believers and followers making the prophecy indisputable and unretractable. Third, the failure of the prophecy was blamed on a massive government conspiracy feeding far-right anti-government narratives and exploiting political opportunities and perceived threats to challenge the legitimacy of a presidential election. Not surprisingly, this narrative framing of the prophetic failure can be linked to the Stop the Steal political campaign, President Trump's false claims that the election was stolen and the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. And fourth, some NRA prophets took actions to invoke divine intervention to change the outcome of the election by helping to organize and promote the December 12th, 2020 and January 5th, 2021 Jericho marches around the Capitol. The Jericho March is a pro-life, pro-Trump coalition that sponsors marches around state capitals and other government sites. The organization's name and its targeted campaigns draw from the Old Testament in which God commanded Israelites to march around the walls of an evil city, causing the walls to crumble and following and allowing the Israelites to conquer in battle. These extraordinary actions of defiance and political activism push the boundaries of responses to failed prophecy beyond anything here, heretofore observed. The pro-Trump prophets who expressed defiance unanimously blamed the outcome of the fraudulent election, I'm sorry, blamed the outcome of a fraudulent election claiming it was stolen to fomenting anger and acrimony. Specifically, this group of oracles expressed open derision, contempt, and scorn for the election results and the new president-elect, fueling rancorous outrage that can be linked to the Capitol siege. The video of the January 6th uh, insurrection reveals explicit Christian nationalist symbols and ideas and expressions among many of the rioters. Um, for months, uh, these prophets uh, vilified and demonized uh, Biden and the Democrats, uh, calling them uh, antichrist uh, crooks, uh, who were promoting a satanic agenda and promoting the idea of uh, voter fraud. The substance of defiant responses can be seen in the words and messaging among prophets in the analysis of statements made in interviews in an array of venues on Elijah streams and on various YouTube channels on social media and in both religious and secular news coverage. Uh, Robin Bullock co-founder of Youth Force Ministries Church in International uh, Alabama, personifies the defiant response among the subset of prophets following the November election when he claimed voter fraud and declared Trump the rightful president. In June 2021, on his 11th hour program, Bullock demonized President-elect Biden and made the following statement. Quote, I watched Joe Biden during the campaign that he clearly lost. He lost big. He lost enough to be ashamed he lost enough to tell him, nobody likes you, Joe. I mean, he lost enough to know that. It was bad. If they would show him the real numbers, the man would be ashamed. But I remember he leaned into the mic during the debate and told President Trump, we're coming for you, and he growled out this demonic sound. It was a demonic voice. Greg Locke, a pastor of Baptist Global Vision Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, prophesied number of time, number of times before the election that Trump would be uh, elected. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <clears throat> Locke has framed uh, uh, Trump's re-election as vital to the survival of America and casts the contest as a civil war calling on the troops of God's holy army to take up the battle in his book appropriately tri uh, titled, This Means War. Jeff Jansen, a self-proclaimed prophet and former head of Global Fire Ministries in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, has also demonstrated defiance in his response to the election results and failed prophecy in May 2021. Jansen said he was, quote, 
quadrupling down on his prophecy that former President Trump would be reinstated in a very short time. Prophetess, Prophetess Kat Kerr, speaking at One Accord Christian Fellowship in Orlando, Florida, claimed to have a vision saying that the scroll was opened in heaven when Joe Biden was inaugurated on January 20, revealing that Donald Trump was actually still president on earth and in heaven. Paula White Kane, Trump's uh, former spiritual advisor in the White House, hosted a prayer service after the November election results during which she declared God's intention to reinstate Trump as president. She said, God has already settled his mind about the election. We will override any will of man over the mind of God. Blaming evil forces, White Cain reiterated that the Lord has already made his decision and that there was a spiritual battle raging. Brad Knight, Paula White Cain's son, and is also pastor of Story Life Church in Orlando, offered a combative prayer at the same prayer service. Knight cast him as cast himself as a warrior in the mold of King David and believes he holds earthly authority due to his, quote, apostolic mantle. He made this following statement. Make the ends of the earth our possession, God. Everyone who has risen against us, everyone who mocks us, everyone who has power, everyone who thinks they, are, they have victory because they applauded every will, even the church that is not aligned with you. Break it, God. Do not even hear their prayers. Nullify their cries and break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Andre Gagne, professor of theological studies at Concordia University in Montreal, offered the following commentary on Brad Knight's prayer. The iron rod is clearly an image of violence and subjugation by force and targets anyone who gets in their way. Knight revealed their violently anti-democratic impulses when he asked God to take his iron rod and smash his alleged opponents. Gagne also noted that this biblical in imagery was used in the context of theocratic rulership and perhaps a better characterization of the prophet's ideology is Christian nationalism. I contend that the reactions to failure prophecy among the subgroup of defiant pro-Trump prophets must be seen in the context of the Christian nationalist ideology. It is evident that the claims to divine revelation or charismatic authority have been invoked by the prophets to advance a political agenda. Rosenberg describes the goal of the movement as one committed to replacing democracy with a religious nationalism that is a necessary prelude to Christ's return on earth. In a book by Lance Walno, God's Chaos Candidate, Donald J. Trump and the American Unraveling, he claims to have received a revelation by Trump that he was, I'm sorry, a revelation that Trump was chosen by God to prepare America for the chaos that is coming. Walner asserts that Trump is a Cyrus figure and has a Cyrus anointing, a reference to the ancient Persian king that God used to end the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. Walner and other prophets uniformly adopted this narrative that Trump was a modern day Cyrus, a symbol of deliverance. Trump was cast as an instrument in God's plan to destroy the demonic forces of the deep state. Walno and another prominent prophet, Mark Taylor, predicted that Trump would win the 2016 election, and this set the stage for a massive foray into political prophecies by a surge of new prophets. President Trump played to the NAR agenda, promising to end abortion by nominating pro-life justices to the Supreme Court, providing federal protection for those opposing LGBTQ rights, and restoring a Christian America. He courted conservative leaders and sought their endorsement in exchange for backing. He appointed Paula White Kane to head the Faith and Opportunity Initiative out of the White House, which she used to bring aboard Christian nationalist leaders. This operation sub subsequently became the base for coordinating activities of Christian nationalist leaders who supported Trump, and the president was willing to appoint these Christian nationalist figures to top administrative points, posts throughout the federal government and to the federal courts. Andrew Whitehead and Samuel P uh, Perry have offered the most incisive analysis of Christian nationalism in their recent book, Taking America Back for God. Drawing from survey data from the 20 uh, 2017 Baylor Religion Survey, they found that Christian nationalism was a significant and powerful predictor of voting for Trump. Defiant NAR prophets played an integral role in the Jericho March leading up to the January 6th insurrection. They spoke at Jericho March events 
Uh, these names include all the top uh, leaders that you would recognize. One such leader, uh, Kurt Landy, Landry, told the crowd at Jericho March he had a vision of Moses leading the flock of sheep like the prophets of old. God was raising up new leaders to righteously align the nation with God's divine order and instruction. Lance Walno called on demonstrators at the Jericho March to join an uprising. This is the beginning of a Christian populist rising. Uprising. There is a backlash coming, and you're going to see this wrecking ball of a reformation hit the church as well because it's going to divide all those who are awake and those that are asleep. There is a great awakening coming, and this is a spark that's starting it now. Greg Locke uh, rallied the troops at, December, at the December 12th Jericho March, telling the crowd, God is on our side. America is the last bastion of Christian freedom. It's the last bastion of capitalism. I declare unto you that President Donald Trump is going to stay four more years in the White House. We are a mighty army. Shay Ahn, a prophet and pastor at Harvest Rock Church in Pasadena, California, called the week leading up to January 6th the most important in U.S. history. He said, quote, I believe this is the week we're going to show, throw Jezebel out and Jehu's going to rise up and we're going to rule and reign through President Trump under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The January 5th Jericho March and Save America rally opened with a prayer by Paula White Cain in which she implored God to smite the president's enemies and let, ever, excuse me, let every adversary against democracy, against freedom, against life, against justice and peace be overturned right now in the name of Jesus. The following day, President Trump uh, urged the crowd to fight like hell, and with hour, within hours the, cry, the crowd laid siege to the Capitol, attacking police, smashing doors and windows, and breaching the Senate chamber in order to stop certification of the election results by Congress. Standing on the platform where the President's Senate provides, insurrectionists raise their arms and thank God uh, and stop to pray in Christ's holy name. Yale professor Philip Gorski has observed that Christian nationalism draws on Old Testament discourses of blood conquest and apocalypse. These themes of violence provide ideological justification for the kinds of actions seen on January 6. Whitehead and Perry have shown the affinity of Christian nationalism, what they call divine militarism, and they found a powerful link between Christian nationalist beliefs and believing that God's people must fight for wars of good. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you very much for holding your time. Um, we're going to give the floor to the audience if there are any questions. Yeah, I can see a question in the back of the room. Thank you. Actually, I want to make a link between the, the, what you just explained and what was explained just before, because I think there is a, a very interesting similarity between this uh, Christian nationalism in the US and Christian nationalism in Russia nowadays with Patriarch Kirill and many others. So my question would be, are these people who are obviously pro-Trump, are they pro-Putin today? Or can you see something like this? I, I've seen s it, it's it's mixed. I, I've seen some of that in Fox News uh, by commentators, um, but I haven't seen uh, a massive out, out uh, pouring of, of sentiment toward, toward Putin. Um, but just to follow up on what you said, um, I, I think this kind of nationalism is sweeping Europe, too. I mean, we see it in Germany, we see it in the UK, we see it in France, we see it in... Uh, well, I mean, th this isn't Christian either. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a religious label for a political movement, yeah. And, but so to give it legitimacy, uh, they invoke divine uh, imprimatur, yeah. Massimo? No, I, <clears throat> I just want to share a private experience. I was last month in Seoul, and seated next to me was Paula White, <laughs> because we were both invited by Mrs. Moon 
to a rally after the Abe assassination. By the way, I've never attended one of Mrs. Moon rallies before, but I decided to go because of the Abe assassination and to see what the reaction was. Now, the interesting point for me is that uh, between uh, this you describe as a right uh, paranoid uh, fringe of American politics uh, and the main line, it doesn't seem to be such a big border because she traveled on the same plane with Mike Pompeo and Newt Gingrich. Yeah. And the three of them were always together and uh, looked like best friends. Uh, so meaning there is uh, in the Republican Party where you will see, I mean, Pompeo is a businessman from traditional uh, Republican uh, uh, upbringing. Uh, Gingrich surely is the establishment of the Republican Party. It doesn't seem that these people are perceived as crazy or marginal. Uh, we are probably witnessing a sort of uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, within the Republican Party uh, of uh, uh, people uh, like uh, uh, Paula White. And the price they pay, to get to the question of Eric, uh, is of course these people should uh, uh, speak out, at least in the conference they went with, against Putin and in favor of uh, Ukraine. Uh, because no matter what Trump personally thinks for the Republican establishment, it would be a no-no to be in favor of Putin. So it's, uh, I mean, one risk uh, is to uh, consider all this as just a sort of a footnote or fringe, while uh, I believe it's becoming very much part of the Republican mainstream. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, um, I th in fact, I think that the Republican Party has been taken over by this this fringe, and they're not the fringe anymore. Um, we now refer to them as MAGA Republicans, Make America Great Again. And, 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 and Trump's endorsement uh, will almost guarantee a Republican victory in a primary. Uh, now, how, how that plays out in the general election will be something different to be seen in, in a very short time, next month. Yeah, yeah, well, yes, yeah. yeah midterm elections next month. I see your hand rising, and maybe no, you know. Yeah. Um, does how is sorry <clears throat> how is Trump responding to these prophets? Does he does he uh, actually know about them or, or? Oh yeah, he's embraced them. Oh yeah. Paula, oh yeah. I I had a. Let's see if I can pull that up again. That answer your question? Yeah, I can feel it. <laughs> Instrumentalizing. <yeah. laughs> but thank you for this answer. Sometimes a picture is uh, more clear than a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the famous photos, yes, yeah. of the, the, the events. Yeah. Ah, okay. I could see another hand who was writing in here, yeah. You mentioned about the uh, 17 American prophets talking about uh, uh, Donald Trump. I wonder if you could uh, identify a little bit about who those are the prophets. Are they uh, uh, running uh, such a big size of a congregation or just less than? I wonder any group, any prophet running more than 10,000 congregation or just like a couple of hundred congregations. What is the size of the uh, the prophets uh, uh, running each? Yeah, um, most of these are mega churches, very large churches. When um, you say mega church, it's about 1,000 or it's uh, more than 5,000? You know, I haven't really done any any research because, uh, on, on sizes. Uh, because those lists, I can't see the major uh, organizations. But keep in mind that, that these, these uh, prophets and apostles have their own YouTube channels. So they, they reach audiences that are way beyond anybody who can come and sit in their congregation physically. So they have, um, you know, that they, uh, they reach people in other countries even. So uh, it would be hard to put a, a number on on the size of these churches, kind of depending on how you would define uh, a congregation. Yeah, yeah, my point is how influence those 
is when they publicize something, but the, uh, you sort of uh, it's spreading all over the world through the internet, that is very common for most of people nowadays. Mm. But uh, if they practically running a certain size of the congregation, whatever prophets say, it will be very effective, not only that congregation, but also nationwide or internationally. But the list you have is 17. Uh, according to my information, I can't see they, they are the major uh, organizations. I, I think th they have a sizable out uh, influence and maybe an outsized influence because of the way in which Trump embraced them, brought them in, and sort of endorsed them, gave them his imprimatur. And um, they certainly were given a much bigger stage and a much bigger voice. And what I tried to do in the paper was link their influence to Trump in, in the January 6th insurrection um, because as some of the photos I showed you, and, and there are many others I could have added to this PowerPoint slide, there were all kinds of Christian symbols and, and people wearing Trump uh, paraphernalia. I mean, they, it, it, White and Perry call it a divine militarism. It's a justified violence in, in, uh, in God's name because uh, we have to save America from uh, its destruction and its uh, spiraling downward uh, into evil. And so violence then becomes necessary. It's kind of a version of just war theory, I think. Thank you. Uh, maybe a last question for uh, Massimo. Uh, it's just a suggestion about something which I find totally overlooked, I'm sorry, by American scholars. Uh, uh, that there is a parallel and very strong uh, Catholic movement, which is uh, more extreme, uh, if anything, as is led by Archbishop Viganò, who was the papal ambassador to Washington, D.C., and then uh, he said he went underground because he may be killed, but he's still an archbishop in good standing. The Pope has not sanctioned him. And he also uh, has written... Uh, uh, many letters about the fact that Trump is the president and Biden is not. Uh, the reason, and Vigano surely has a seizable following, the reason it's difficult for Vigano to cooperate with the new apostolic reformation is that uh, very explicitly Vigano considers Trump a prophet of God, but he also considers Putin a prophet of God, which is something that many Protestant Americans who are pro-Trump will not endorse. But in discussing with American colleagues, uh, I feel that the Vigano movement is completely overlooked. But if you look at the figure of how many follows him on uh, YouTube, on Instagram, you see they are in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. Okay, I'll be contacting you for that, uh, that information. <laughs>